um, as a company, um, we have lots of ways we motivate employees to do objectives, and uh, we have budget schemes and so on. Um, how do you, especially bearing in mind what happened last night, how do you motivate your team <laughs> and, and get them back up to where they're you know, winning one? Well, yeah, it is about motivation. Um, first of all, you want to make sure they've got self-motivation. I think I always look about it, if you can try and get people in your football club, people around you who are motivated, the artists are trying to make sure they don't become demotivated. So that's the first and foremost thing that I look at. Uh, you want people to come to work and enjoy doing what they're doing and push themselves to be the best that they can be. Yeah, we had a nightmare game last night. Uh, poor performance, it's fair to say. Poor result after being ever so good this season. Uh, so this morning, we were back in again. And like every game, what we go and do, we um, try and learn the lessons from it. And we always have a debrief. So like, for example, this morning, it's a continual theme, whether we win, lose, or draw. Uh, we had the debrief this morning. Well, before I started it, I put it on the wall. A quote from Abraham Lincoln. A house divided amongst itself cannot stand. And again, it's just highlighting to people that expectation levels can, can grow a little bit and all of a sudden we start to become a little bit divided amongst ourselves and looking to blame other people, um, it can affect us. So we've got a great team spirit, a great unity, uh, and you need to have that stability to be successful, I believe. So anyway, we, we put that as a quote to start off with and then we've done a 20-minute uh, video presentation. I've obviously gone through the game, watched it again, highlighted a lot of things that we do well at, uh, things that we can improve on. And basically we have a discussion then, and again I'm trying to get the, the spirits back up again for the players. Uh, and I finished off with a one minute clip, and it was a guy, a basketball guy, a black guy just there, and he's tossing a, a basketball up in the air, and he's blaming everything, oh I can't train today, it's too cold, oh I've got a bit of a cold coming in, and so, oh, I don't really fancy doing that, why have I got to do that? And it's about a minute, he's just going on complaining and whinging about everything. And then you see him get the ball, and he just puts the ball down, he said, and anyway, your legs, are, uh, your legs are too sore. He gets the ball and he puts it down. As he's bringing the ball down, you can see he's in a wheelchair and he's got no legs. And it was just a, a little phrase of some like, it was just like, just do it. And it was silence for a minute. And I just tried to get through to the players, look, we stick together, because they're an honest, hard-working group of people and we've been very consistent with it. We've learned the lessons from the game, things we did well, things we could have done better at. Put that game to bed, realise how lucky we are, and we keep working very hard for each other without whinging about anything, go complain about injuries and suspensions and this, that, and because everyone's going to go and do it. You go out and have that self motivation to be a link in the chain, um, to be successful together, because that's what we'll be team. Together, everyone achieves more. So, we've done that. So, there's a load and load of different things. I'm just using that as an example I've done today. We've done a load of different things. I mean, last year when we, we lost the game, um, at Brentford, did ever so well, lost the game. The next morning when we had the debrief, I got a, um, there was a video, I remembered it. So, there's loads of things that float around, you might remember it. Last year in the 72 Olympics where he's running around and he fell over, but he's picked himself back up and he's gone and won the Olympic gold medal in the world record time. So it's even though we're through defeat, you can still, there's the story somewhere along the line to, to motivate people to keep going forward. But answering your question, get motivated people in. I guess the question I would like to ask you is how do you keep them motivated when money maybe isn't the biggest motivator in their life? What, what sort of things, what other things do you do, you do to, to sort of keep them going in the right direction? It's been interesting since I've come down to Southampton. Obviously, you hear a lot more different things going on. There is a, a shed load of money that gets knocked about. Um, far too much money in my mind, especially for the younger ones, they get far too much too early without really having earned that. Um, Again, it goes down to the motivated person. Do you want to have money? Do you want to be successful in your career? I say to them, again, first day, you are a self-employed businessman. You've got 10 years to make as much money as you can. Your body is the business. You have to get, extract as much potential out of that business as you can. In 10 years, if you're lucky, the lifespan ain't 10 years of a football player. You're that away from an injury that you never play again. I was a physio for 10 years. Obviously, I saw players who, one tackle, we had a young lad, he was tipped for the top, horrendous leg break, never played again. But you were with him through his rehabilitation side of it. Um, so the players have to be aware that you've got that and your career's gone. I had myself, 23, I was, you know, I had a decent career when I was young, with the poor schoolboys, this, that, and the other. 
to the right, broke that cheekbone, that broke that cheekbone, tried me with him. That wrist, that finger, double fracture of the spine. 23 of mine in the hospital bed thinking, shit, I'm not going to walk again, let alone play football. So I got myself fit again, got carried on playing football. So all the other Patel attended me this. So you, you're that from never playing, you know? Um, so you've got to extract everything out of your body. Now, you do that, you're a businessman, get as much money as you can. Yeah. But when you're 90 and you're rocking in your rocking chair, and the grandchildren are going up saying, well, granddad, what did you do in your life? They're not interested in your money. They're interested in turning around and going, oh, I won that medal when we won League One. We won the championship. We played in the Premier League. Oh, we played this game. You obviously have a lot of what's called bigger egos. Um, how, how do you manage that? You put one out for that sort of thing. What, what's your technique for coping with those type of people? It's interesting, isn't it? I suppose like, like in business, you've got somebody who always sort of wants to be the top dog, thinks he's better than everybody else. Um, day one when I walked into to Southampton, similar to when I had it at Scunthorpe, got everybody in the room. Um, and it's about the players controlling the dressing room themselves. No one's bigging anybody else. There's a certain set of rules. I have one rule, don't do anything detrimental to yourself or the team, face the consequences of your actions if you do. So that leaves it open-ended to me, I can stamp on them like, what they do whatever I want to go and do. But they've got to have that within themselves, like in business, you know, if you're supposed to be at 9 o'clock, be at 9 o'clock, not five minutes past nine. And if somebody does push that rule, then it's about the group keeping in, in line. Um, because it's about the peers, you let your teammates then down. So if you turn up for five minutes late for work every single day, then you show no respect for your work colleagues and you think you're better than what anybody else is. So that's just a, a small little thing. Um, but the egos are there. The surrounded, the highlights are all there. You've got players who think, as I said, think they're better than what they are, and they don't have to do, I don't have to be at 9 o'clock, I don't have to do my pre-activation, I don't have to do my rehab, I don't need to do a nice bath, I don't need to run around. Well, you do, and you're going to be part of the team. So we have, we have a technology, we have a GPS system, uh, we use for fitness, and we, we post it all up on the wall, so that the players can see how hard they're working, the intensities that they've got to do, the heart rate monitors, we do a hydration test every morning. So basically, they have to come in, you have a wee into a bottle, it gets tested, it takes five seconds. But it's posted on the wall. So you're expected to come in at a certain level of hydration, able to go and train. Because if you're not, you're running the risk of injury. If you're not, you're being disrespectful to the rest of your teammates. You get weighed before training, you get weighed after training. So there's a load and load of different things. This is the culture we have. So. We have that implemented. So when a new player comes in, it's kind of, oh, this is what we do at Southampton. So it's a, oh, right, okay, that's what we've got to do. So if you're either on board or you're not. Yeah. Well, let's talk about the youngsters, because obviously in a, in a football club, um, I guess the average age of, of your team together is probably less than, certainly less than 30, maybe even less than 25. 28. 28, which is, which is again, a lot younger than a lot of companies would have to deal with. Um, you know, in, in the company, like, Three, we do a lot of academy work, we do a lot of uh, mentoring and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's a challenge to us. So how do you cope with, with such a young workforce? If you like? How do you keep them motivated and moving forward? Yeah, it is. I mean, we've got, <coughs> excuse me, we've got a real big academy here, um, and it is the future of Southampton, because we want to, <coughs> the vision that's sold for me, and it's right that we've got to get 50% of the youngsters through to the first team. So we've got to make sure there is a pathway through. I think in football, too many managers in the first team are only interested in the here and the now. I haven't got, I can't wait for the youngsters coming through because I'm going to lose my job. The average manager in the championship last year. You know, so if you're lucky, you're going to be moving around. So that's probably why a lot of football clubs struggle because the stability is not there. <clears throat> now, if we want to bring our youngsters through, we've got to make sure that there's a pathway for them. Um, we've got the, the, the different coaches in the different age groups who are specialised in them areas because it is important. I think when you get to 16 to 18, they're not ready for the first team, but the talented, talented players. So it's bridging that gap from there, this middle island, to then get to the first team. How can we get them through? So you talk about mentors. I think if you've got good senior professionals who can talk to the players and show them lead by example, we do a lot of training with the, the development players, the youngsters, the development players, train with the first team. And we keep saying, set the right example. Remember what it was like when you were a youngster, training with the first team. You'd always tell a story about, oh, he was 
it didn't bother him, he was rubbish this, that, and the other, and his attitude was rubbish. You have a good attitude. So you surrounded the youngsters in a good culture with the right standards and principles on how we want to do things like punctuality, like working hard in training, like doing the right things, like the principles, like encouraging people all the time, and having that positive environment. But we've got good coaches to help them through. I think it's the whole culture and environment that you have to have. But there's a pathway for them. So, so uh, uh, anecdotally, I heard an interesting story about Big Shannon from years ago. Obviously, we, we play here. Um, and the story was he got to a point where his, his other interests um, started to take his football interests. And uh, I believe he went to the manager one day, who's Laurie McMenemy in those days, and said, um, Laurie, do you mind if I don't train anymore because it's getting away from me uh, getting a bet on it at um, five o'clock or whatever. And in those days, that was, a, that was almost an okay conversation. Did you ever get people trying it on like that these days? Um, not these days. We've got, we've got plenty of, from a senior point of view, we've got plenty of, even from the development board, and we've got some players who live, ab uh, live abroad and come and play for us. So whenever there's an opportunity, it's any chance of me going away, going home for the weekend, I've got a playing board in this, that, and this. So you have to manage that, manage that for the group as well. But you have to be mindful that they live away. They're here in this country working, but their home is actually in Portugal, for example. So you've got to try and allow them that time to get a bit more from them. So you've got to work that right. Um, the years I had as a physiotherapist, I had um, drug addicts, gamblers, alcoholics, marriage breakups, this time. You have it all. You talk about that one story. I can tell one story. Premier League player. He went in to his manager, wrote a cheque out for 100 grand, <clears throat> over the desk. I'm not coming in this week. They'll be fine. And he went and worked for Armani and got 200 grand for that week's work. So we talk about motivating people or whatever, or where the ego is, yes, yeah. and where you are. Oh, yeah, there's some difference, you know. You talk about multi-million pound players now, you look at the, the kid who's at Manchester City now, he's getting all the exposure, um, Balotelli. How do you manage him? Yeah, <laughs> you know, how do you manage him? He's, he's just a loose cannon. Yeah. So do you want in your culture, in your environment, somebody like that who's going to disrupt everything that you're standing for and you're doing, or you're going to allow yourself that one maverick to go and maybe win you something? That's the question people ask themselves. I personally just want to have the right environment and the right culture that you've got, you're surrounding yourself with. So I think that's going to be a long-term view, better than maybe that one small period of time. Who's probably not bothered, he's, got no, he's probably got no interest in where he is, he's just there for the, for the money himself, and it's about himself and not maybe the whole culture that he's surrounded with. Um, I think over the years as well, when you look at it, you want to have people who will run through a brick wall for the team, for the teammates, and you want to be part of that team. And it is a certain age that you've got to turn around sometimes and go, I've got to let you move on now because we need to evolve the group and evolve the team. But if they're honest and hard working for you, you try and get them a good move as well, or lead them down a the line of a different career pathway or at the end of the, 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 the end of the career. Uh, so that they can still continue, maybe at a different level, but if you don't evolve, you'll get held back as well. So you have to let people go. But I think there's a way of doing it, a way of trying to help people move on. Because you've got, if you recruit properly in the first place, you've probably got the right person. So you want to look after that right person. Um, so I, is I, I did it when I was at Scunthorpe. We don't do it here. I used to get all the apprentices in. I thought that was important. If we decided we were going to keep them on, it's totally different here. I'll be honest with you. At Scunthorpe, we had a two-year apprenticeship. To give them a, a, a professional contract, they had to be ready to go to the first team squad. Therefore, my budget in the first team, therefore capable of playing in the first team. Here, it's totally different. So they've got a lot longer to get through. It's very rare that a youngster at 18 gets into the first team anyway. And, you know, So those players that can have a little bit more development will actually help. And I used to sit every single one of them down. I'd put my club shirt tie on and do it all properly and sit down speak through it all properly with them, and then, but try and help them get another career after it. Um, and again, I go through my own experience, because that was my own, my youngest lad, who um, got released. Um, but trying to, it's trying to speak properly to them, and help them, because at the end of the day, they're human beings. And if you're trying to have a, a culture and environment, you want good human beings. Now, if they want to go and break the, the rules, and disrespect everybody, then sometimes that's not letting go, that's getting rid. I 
think, well, parents nowadays, it is. I think we've got we've got a, a very important responsibility. Yes, it's about football. It's only going to be so many that make it to the top. We've got to try and give them an opportunity to make a living out of the game, whether that's a professional level at Premier to League Two, to Conference, to non-league part-time, because you still enjoy the some form of ability. But you've got to give them an opportunity to carry on their development <coughs> as young men or older men into a new career. You know, 30, 35, what's your new career? A lot of times I have players who were, will be driving, uh, one player, he was, uh, he was 32, loads and loads of games, he had a, fair, a little bit of money, he'd done his knee, so we're driving, I said, what are you going to do when you finish playing? I don't know, I've thought about it. Why not? You're probably going to have to retire through your injury anyway, but you should have been thinking about this years and years ago, because you've got another 30 years of life to go and do something. You need another career pathway. Um, and you'll find that so many cricket, it's, it's been quite relevant. I don't know if anyone saw the thing the other night on um, Flintoff about the depression, but a lot of cricketers actually died or commit suicide quite early after playing. And I think depression kicks in a lot with football players. The divorce rate goes through the roof straight after they finish their career. A lot of them start drinking, getting into all sorts of problems because they haven't got that regimented program or that next career pathway to go into. So again, go back to letting go. Player X, you've done great for us. You're not going to be in the plans because the team's got to be Can we get you another career pathway or another club or something like that? We'll speak properly with them, help them. Okay. Did you have thoughts when you were younger about your own career progression? Or did it, was it as a, a kickstart because of what happened to you that you got into where you are now? I was, I was, I was going to I was going to be the best goalkeeper. I was going to play in the Premier League and. Do all that, and when I was younger, I was okay. 17, maybe Dave used to leave the goalkeeper to play for Tramming. Um, tip to do really, really well. Brought that cheap bow, mate. And during the days, we stick under the crossbar, smack him, see what he's made of. And that's what I was used to. So you just get up and you keep going. And uh, in the days in the dressing room where everybody would just fight and shout and bollock you, and all that. You, should, you can't say boo to any of the players now, they start crying. Uh, society, it's, it's changed. From school up, because there's no there's no discipline in school. It's totally changed. But going back to the question, I'm lying in a hospital bed at the age of 23, thinking, oh, am I going to walk again? Oh, what am I going to do? Surgeon comes in, he said, now the night I've got your spine, I've fused it all together, give me a good whiz round, you'll be all right. I was, it wasn't it wasn't nice. But I'm lying there, thinking, right, what can I do? What can I do? I had my own Sunday league team, uh, ran by Drovers. So uh, when I was at uh, 18, 19, they were all my mates, they didn't have a manager, I said I'll manage it, and we went all the way through the uh, Ben Henson Millie 4 3 2 1 Premier. So that was really good for me for the 10 years. But I'm lying there thinking, what I'm going to do, I know I'll be a coach so I can coach my teams, I'll get my own gym so I can get them fit, and if they're injured, then I'll treat them so I'll get paid for coaching the team, I'll get paid for having my own business. I'll do my own treatment of injury clinic. So I had all the things in my mind that when I come out, I built my table around as a dinner plate with a sauce and all that, and that was my little empire. But I got myself fit, the physio had left, I got myself fit, I got back in the first team. Saved the penalty in front of the cop, John Barnes, double penalty save. So everything was rosy again, I was, I was happy. And uh, But then I broke, I tore the patella tendon as well. So anyway, at the age of 28, I was still playing, I was halfway through a degree course my wife, God bless her, was uh, as a little bit ill and just decided to go non-league. And uh, she's great. And it's just uh, finished my degree course, go non-league, part-time at Bangor, get through the degree course, look after the kids, and go from there. It's, it's quite unusual these days. I mean, a lot of footballers want to end up as managers. Not all of them are the best. What sort of traits would you say a good manager needs to have to be successful? You've got to be lucky. That helps. I think you've got to be organised. I think you've got to understand people. You've got to listen. You've got to set out clearly defined, uh, defined roles and re responsibilities, a framework to what you've got. I think your discipline's got to be right. You've got to be firm, but fair with people. I think that's vitally important. Um, and be understanding. Do you think it helps having been a footballer, or do you think that's not important? Because there are one or two of you are making it who haven't necessarily had great football career. Yeah. I think
think how many goalkeepers have been good managers, how many physios have been good managers, how many top level players have been good managers. What's a good manager? I've been fortunate that I've played. So when we want to have a conversation with a player, I can actually draw on experiences of playing. From the, the medical department, I can draw on with them. Injuries, I can go and do that. I've managed, we've been successful. So you can draw on experiences, you can draw on stories. Um, and I think, I think that's important that you, you can't just go and do it very young. You've got to have negative experiences. It's like last night, I've learned a lot of things last night, which will put me in better stead for the future as a manager. Um, but you need to keep winning games of football. Who would your mentors be if you had to name them? Um, who were mentors? Um, I think when we look at it, I started off as a schoolboy at Liverpool, and the philosophy there was always pass and move. I was very fortunate that Bob Paisley was the manager there. Roy Evans running him around and you go training with them and you had that. So that was always something, that the enthusiasm that they had to train, you know, we go a couple of nights a week sort of thing and they'd be there, they were the first team, but they go training with us as a kid and the enthusiasm was great um, and always willing to help. I go to Tramier Overs, Brian Hamilton was my manager, he went to manage Northern Ireland, very enthusiastic and again, if anything, they were the days where, you know, cups of tea were thrown around the dressing room. So then I've learned that's not the way to go and do it. So there's something that I've learned. But Brian was someone I could always pick the phone up to. Um, Frank Worthington used to be here. Frank was uh, my manager for a year at um, the Tramway. Frank actually sent me down here for a week to work with Shilton. Um, so that was an interesting week. Very interesting week. But Frank was different because we used to be trying to run up down the woods, do loads of roads of running. We come to uh, pre-season with Frank Worthington. It was five aside every morning, finished by one. I was totally different. Um, so that was him. Brian Rose was the manager that I worked with at uh, Scunthorpe for 10 years. So they were the managers that I had. What traits did they bring? But the two Brian's were very, um, very aggressive in the manner, which I've tried to go the other way with. Um, I did go on loads and loads of courses, fitness courses, physio courses, management courses. Um, Steve McLaren, he got a lot of abuse when he was here. Uh, one of the things that he opened me up to, he came, they just won the treble with Man United, and he came and stood up, and uh, he gave a great presentation, and the thing that he opened up to me was the reading of books from America, basketball, baseball, American football, um, and I got to read a lot more from that, and take a lot more in from different sports. I found that really interesting. So Clive Woodward gave a talk the following year. I was really, I'm really into my rugby, um, and this was 2002, so the build-up to the, the World Cup when they won, and he came and gave a talk in a room of all football managers, but it was a business model. I'm in physio, the best fitness coach, the best backs coach, forwards coach, nutrition, all of that sort of thing, but I'll be sitting on top of it. I, I was, I got his book after that, so I was really taken back. I thought it was a really, really good model that he was promoting. Um, a fairness as well, because he used to video all the training sessions. From that, I went to go and video all my training sessions that we were going to do. Again, someone make a mistake and do a little DVD of it, slip it under his, his door and say, you just cost us the World Cup. That, so you saw that discipline, that play with them, learn from that one. Um, but the interesting thing was, we're in a room full of all football managers and he stood there and you could just see all the people in the room were, you could just sense it. I, because I like the rugby, I thought it was really good. And someone stood up and gone, oh, well, like working football. Of course it will, it's a business model. So it will work, but people weren't prepared to take on, I know he came here by the way, and I don't know, so I don't know what all the politics were with that, but the business model worked. Because you get the right people in, and allow them to go and do the jobs that you've got to go and do, so that was really good. Um, and then the other one was Sam Allardyce. He, um, obviously we were in competition with him now at, at West Ham, he wasn't interested in anything but winning. That was the big thing. Um, whatever you've got to go on. Doesn't matter how he's a big one on his stats, so obviously you're looking at that. And again, you've got to put the ball in there so many times you've got like to score a goal, certain ages of your team, um, all sorts of different things. So he was big on that and it's not about performance, it's about winning, finding a way to win. So they were three different people. I don't know them very well, but they were really, really interesting I don't speak to, but they were really, really interesting talks that 
I took a lot from.